Gentlemen, if we can stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hello, everybody. Nice crowd here tonight. Nice to see. Is there anyone here for public participation? Anyone signed up? No one signed up. Public participation? No, thank you very much. We'll move on to the report of the chair. We have the recognition of the 2023 National Merit Commended Students. Joe? You got it. And uh, uh, unfortunately, Steve uh, Swenson is sick today, but standing in his, uh, in his way is uh, Mr. Law. Mr. Law is going to introduce our, uh, our, our commended students today. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll stand over here and after I'm done kind of presenting, we can have uh, each of you guys come up and, uh, and, and receive your award certificate. <coughs> uh, about 1.5 million kids take the PSAT every year. And the top quarter of 1% of those students receive a commended uh, national merit, national merit um, scholarship program award. The letter of commendation signifies your designation as a committed student in the National Merit Scholarship Program. When you take the PSAT in junior year, it says all these letters after it, NMSQT, and that's what it all stands for. Okay. Uh, your high selection index score places you among the top 50,000 students who entered the 2023 National Merit Program by taking the 2021 uh, PSAT. You are among 34,000 out of that 50,000 commended students nationwide who have shown exceptional academic promise. The degree of success you achieve in the future will depend on you, your use of abilities, and your perseverance towards the goals you set for yourself. Uh, in addition to this certificate, you also qualify for certain scholarship awards. So it's a, it's a really great honor, obviously, to be in the top one quarter of 1% of all students who take this national test is quite enough. So when I call your name, please come up. This is Joe. Oh, Joseph Eisenman. Stay up here. Stay, stay, stay up here. Stay up here. Yeah, we're going to take a big picture. Uh, Cole Gekos. Molly Halliday. Lohit Jagalamudi. Siddharth Pamalapati. Vishwajit Selvaraju. Photo? Joe, did? Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Just smile and wave, boys. Just smile. <laughs> <laughs> We're good. Congratulations. Congratulations to you all. That's an amazing accomplishment. Good job. Keep up the good work. Uh, the only other thing that I have under report of the chair is I just want to remind uh, board members that make sure that you uh, email the help desk as far as the two-factor um, certification for to get your emails on either phones or at home. Um, I did, and it's a very simple process. So. I think so, yeah. Paul, right? I'm sorry. Did Paul leave already? Yeah. Paul, uh, to, to FA, if you get on the phone, they need to send the email to the help desk, right? If you use the built-in app on your phone, 
phone, you do not need 2FA, it's only for webmail. So, so if you go to webmail or VOE webmail, uh, MonroePS.org, from a computer or a web browser, um, you will need 2FA. Okay. So if I really only get my emails on my phone, do you still want me to email you or no? It's up to you. Okay. I did. If after March 1st, you will not be able to log into the web mail. Then I will email you. But but through the <laughs> but through the mail app or the Outlook app you can on, yes. on devices. Okay. Okay. Yep. All right, thank you. So I just want to remind everybody of that so that uh, you're able to stay in touch. Um, I did it, it was pretty simple. So um, that's all I have. We're gonna move to the consent agenda. Any questions or comments on the minutes from any board members? Hearing none, any comments or questions on the warrant? Yeah, Go ahead, Jeff. It was on page five. It's the water irrigation for Chalk Hill. Um, is that a, like a, uh, I mean, help me with that bill um, as far as what, like why are we still paying Chalk Hill water bills? Because the field. <laughs> backfield is used by Jackson Holland. No, I understand, but it, it not in the wintertime, right? It should, um, it said irrigation, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. So the sprinklers, maybe. Yeah. Well, it, it would be the uh, it would be for the irrigating the backfield. Because if you look at the bill itself, it's pretty close to what each elementary school is paying in that warrant for you that. Know, so if it's if that's a monthly, a quarterly. Jeff, what page are you on? I think uh, I don't. Uh, I think it was page five. <clears throat> The one, uh, yeah, I mean, look at it, you know, we're not talking about the huge yeah, I, number. I can I just, double check. I'm just curious as to, you know, I mean, I, I get it if, we, you know, spring, summer, fall maybe, but if we're talking winter, you know, it shouldn't be in use at all. You know, it, we can we can check with Dan too. Yeah. And get him, it, it is send an email out to the board. Either, you know, was it a minimal usage? I know the, the um, or a monthly budget. Yeah. I know the garage in the That's back what it sounds like, right? Yeah. That, that, that could very well be done. Why don't we check with Dan? Yeah, and we can absolutely. get an email yeah, out to all of us? Yeah. Okay. Is that okay, Joe? That's fine. I just, I mean, my concern is just that it's not a leak or something, right? That we're, yeah, we're paying for something we're not using. Yeah. Yeah. Pick up. Anything else on the warrant from any board members? No? Okay. Notifications of hire, Joe. <clears throat> Yeah, we have uh, two positions on here. One is uh, one is the new preschool position that we talked about. So uh, welcoming Jessica Lee into our preschool. Um, that was the position that we've been talking about for the last couple months mm -hmm. about the, the preschool population getting bigger and bigger. So we've added her. The second position is, is not necessarily a new position. It's a uh, a teacher who was awaiting um, certification. He had finished his, his uh, coursework and had submitted his certification paperwork. We were just waiting for the state to process that. It finally did. So he's been absolutely with us all year. Um, just now, we got the certification okay. is, uh, is, Good. is approved. So we couldn't put him through before without the certification. Okay. Any questions on those? No? Can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? Jerry, seconded by Dennis. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Thank you very much. <coughs> we're going to move to the reports of the committee, starting with our student representatives. Hello. Go right ahead. Good evening, Massac Board of Education. I hope you're having a terrific Tuesday after this past long weekend. Massac Robotics will soon undertake one of their greatest challenges of the year, the March 4th Vex Robotics Regionals Championship. Contestants are working hard to prepare in hopes they're qualifying for the World's Championship. Last week, Massac celebrated Valentine's Day to a great success. The FBLA sponsored sale of chocolate roses and the Be Positives Club selling of homemade Valentine's Day bracelets helped to make the day one to remember for all Massac students and staff alike. Tomorrow, Wednesday the 22nd, the Women's Advocacy Club will meet during Flex to discuss, to discuss women's empowerment and leadership. In addition to students of the Wingmen program, all Massac students are encouraged to attend. Nearing the end of this winter season, here's a Massac sports update. Boys hockey is still booming with a win both home and away. AJ McKetty brought it home with a hat trick, scoring his 100th high school career point in the 6-0 away game. They're now getting ready for senior night this Saturday. 
Girls hockey is also doing very well on the ice, defeating Fairfield Co-op last night 4-3. Girls basketball is coming to an end with their SWC's game already played and their state's game coming up this week. Boys basketball had an exciting game on Saturday against St. Joe's, unfortunately ending in a 78-76 loss for Massick, but Tyler Newsom is back on the Connecticut top performance list, having scored 30 points in that game and 12 out of 12 free throws. Boys Swim has a swim meet tonight. Hopefully they're going strong right now. Finally, dance team is getting ready for their final competition this weekend, States. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, and you placed uh, at the regionals. Uh, SOCs, yeah, we got second. Yep. Brag about yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other committee reports from board members? <clears throat> no? Okay. Pension committee. Yeah, pension, pension committee met a ahead, couple Dennis. of changes of uh, aligning um, paying amount of funds, but nothing drastic and minor minor changes of percentages. Okay. Anything else, Joe? No. No, nope, that was it. It was a very 15-minute meeting. Um, Chrissy, I did put in a request to get pension committee on your... Uh, yes, I was there. On the, Thank you. Uh, the oh. emails, but also on the website. Oh, okay. To get it mentioned on the website. You were there? I was Pension on the change? phone. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, good. All right, thank you. We're going to move to the report of the superintendent. Joe. You got it. I'll start with the uh, fund activity statement, Ron. Okay, so um, pages 34 through 36 in your packet and uh, the year to date budget report for the um, board of that operating fund. Um, everything's pretty much status quo from uh, last month. No real changes at this point. Um, sorry. Um, the the um, utilities, particularly the heat at Stepney Elementary, which is the one school that's still on oil, um, is running a little um, hot, but um, we, we did have some contingency built into the fuel account to, to help cover that, so not a real concern at this point. Um, everything else is, is, like I said, status quo month over month. Um, the big, the one big thing, which I know I've mentioned before, in the tuition um, uh, public, uh, which is showing a huge negative number, that's the uh, excess cost that we have not yet received. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any questions yeah. on anything. Anything for Ron? We're definitely receiving it, Ron. Yes. Uh, Jen, do March 1st. Should be here in the next couple weeks. We should see it about March they make two payments a year, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Insufficient and not enough. I'm oh, sorry. Right. <laughs> we cash the check really quick. Yeah, I was gonna say. I hope it doesn't bounce. Right. <laughs> Anything else for her, for Ron? Okay. You got it. I just wanted to give a, a quick budget update. The uh, the, the uh, first selectman has submitted his budget to town council. That budget consisted of a four hundred seventy-five thousand uh, dollar reduction to our our budget, the board of ed uh, budget. Uh, we knew that we were going to be in in this um, situation. We knew we were going to use any remaining grant funds as part of our budget uh, as a part of our budget process. So our goal, um, <coughs> and we don't really know where we are yet. We're going to obviously keep tracking it, but our, our goal is to absorb that reduction with any remaining grant funds. Uh, and any other realized savings, hopefully um, insurance, uh, utilities, and fuel. Um, do, do not have our insurance numbers yet, uh, but we did lock into electricity uh, and fuel contracts. So we, I know we haven't calculated those uh, that money yet, but hoping to have some savings there. Um, the Board of Finance will get it March 15th, and then um, you know, we anticipate having some updated numbers when the Board of Finance has it. So that's kind of where we are right now. So when, when did the insurance numbers come in? Is that March or May? April? That's late. Yeah. May, right, yeah. yeah. And we still, um, when when Ron and Joe finalize everything too with the grant money, um, it's it's still a good budget. We supported this this budget. Um, we're not expecting any major, major issues, so um, we're not in panic mode at all uh, just yet. We'll panic if we have to, but n not right now. Um, you know, we, we understand uh, the selectman's position and we can move forward supporting this budget and get it to get it through to referendum uh, so like Joe said with the uh, the grant money still has to be finalized we may not know that until May or later 
uh, and then when the insurance money comes in, hopefully we'll see a reduction there, and we can always speak to the Board of Finance about you know making us whole and and going from there. So we we, we have some uh, some breather room there, and we just have to see how it all how it all plays out. So um, I think that's it. Do we know when that Board of Finance meeting is? Or is that the one on the fifth? They haven't set their. So, yeah. Uh, so they get the budget on March fifteenth, and they have it until April twentieth. They have not set their budget schedule. And Jeff, it's likely that they they may be doing adjustments after referendum, right? Well, that's why right. that's my yeah. point in asking. Yeah, and it's going to be important for us. Joe and I were talking uh, before. We're going to attend a lot of PTO meetings, is to get the word out, um, to to come out and vote. Um, we certainly want to support the budget and, and get it passed first first time. So we need all the PTOs to do their share and, and, and us to do our share and get everyone out to, to vote for the budget. Um, we certainly want it to pass the first shot. So a lot of new people in town. We need to get the word out. Mm -hmm. There was a good, to that point, there was a good piece on what the referendum is in the Monroe Sun. If in anybody sun, missed yeah. it, you should look at it because we do have a lot of new families from out of state and such. So. You need to understand what it is, and we need to get the vote out. So, yeah, a new parent to the district actually emailed me this week and uh, was asking some questions about that. So, um, it's nice to see the conversation is out there, and um, got back to her right away and encouraged her to vote and come to meetings. And so, it's good. The word's out there, and we need to do our share. Yeah. Did the board of finance members um, send a list of questions to you yet about budget items? No, not at all. Um, I will go with Joe when, when we present our budget. Um, I don't think there'll be any surprises with the communication that we have. Um, so um, I'm not hearing anything of any additional reductions, but that's up, certainly up to the Board of Finance. So uh, I think we're in a holding pattern right now with uh, not knowing the grant money and not knowing the insurance money. And, and, and again, the budget's right. with council right now, so right. They, don't, they don't get it for a couple more weeks. So. I wouldn't anticipate hearing anything from them until that time. I did have a, a conversation with Jonathan, chair of, of town council. I've spoken with Ken. I've spoken with Mike Manjo. So there's really good communication, and um, we all understand each other's position. And um, as far as the Board of Ed is concerned, they know that we all supported this, this budget. Um, we feel it's needed, and uh, now it's how do we fund it. So... Did the first selectman say why he cut that amount, that particular amount, or did not he? specifically? No. Okay. I think he did say in his uh, in his executive summary he was anticipating it to be covered by grant funds. Yes. Okay. And other and other savings, which is <clears throat> kind of where we are still. Hopefully, it, hopefully it will be. Any other questions on budget update? No. Okay. I just want to give a quick update on the, the lunch program too. Um, funded by the American Rescue Plan Act, um, <coughs> SMART funds, which stands for School Meals Assistance Revenue for Transition, uh, were <coughs> used to offer free lunch for students in the NSLP <coughs> schools. So that's all of our schools except Massac um, through December. And then if you remember when we came back after the break, those funds had been exhausted and um, folks had to start paying for, for lunch again. Uh, earlier this month, the, uh, the legislature unanimously approved and the governor signed House Bill 6671, which allocated another $60 million for the remainder of this year to offer free school meals for children and what they're calling the Smart Funds 2.0. So uh, we're completing the survey. I think, uh, I think our, the survey is already completed that we had to hand into the state to let them know that we would be participating in that. So um, beginning March 1st, we'll have free school meals um, available to the uh, to all of our students in uh, K through eight again uh, for the remainder of the year. Um, like before, that's for the base meals. It doesn't include if kids want to get a la carte items, they can still do so, but they'll have to pay for those. But just as an update, I don't think anyone anticipates that money being available after uh, after this school year, though. Joe, do parents have to uh, take any action on that? They need to enroll? They will not. The only thing I would say, if any parents happen to be watching, is that if you qualify for free uh, free or reduced lunch to still fill out that paperwork because that does uh, that does get factored into the uh, the money distributed to, to the districts okay so the schools will get that message out yes okay yep we sent something out today as a district and then we'll have it uh, we'll have it go out by all the principals uh, this week too okay. 
Okay, great. Good news, good program. Anything else for the superintendent? No? We shall move on to a presentation. Joe, you want to ask? You got it. Yep, I'm going to ask uh, Roseanne Houghton, our K-5 math coordinator, and Kevin Welch, our, our 612. The they will be, yep. Okay. Uh, instructional leader in math to come up. This is the first in um, four presentations, one over the, uh, each month for the next four months in uh, math, science, social studies, and ELA. Just kind of, uh, we thought it would be, you know, take, this take these opportunities um, for short presentations on, on each of those kind of core four academic subjects and kind of re-familiarize um, ourselves with what's going on, highlight any new resources, instructional strategies uh, tonight for uh, math to engage students and meet content standards. So that being said, I'll let Roseanne and Kevin take over. Thank you to Joe and the Board of Education for giving Kevin and I the opportunity to speak to you this evening about mathematics, and we look forward to doing our best for you. We begin with mathematical practices. These are eight practices that describe the thinking processes, habits of mind, and dispositions that students need in order to develop deep, flexible, and enduring understanding of mathematics. That is a quote by Kitty Rutherford from the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. There are eight mathematical practices, and they're grouped on this organizer here to give us a better understanding of what they do for us. You'll see on the left-hand side, problem solving and precision. <clears throat> there are two practices that, that speak to that area, and one is making sense of problems and persevere, and then attend to precision. In math, we hope we do learn to use math to solve problems, and we hope we're, we're accurate when we do that. When we move on to reasoning and explaining, modeling and using tools, and then seeing structure and generalizing. When we looked at these practices, we thought they really speak to some of our goals for vision of the graduate. We want our graduates to be problem solvers. We would like our graduates to be critical thinkers, and we would like our graduates to be able to communicate their thinking to others. And we know we embed these every day in our math classes, and we're proud of that. From mathematical practices, we move forward to the more specific content in mathematics. And these are the standards. These are built from the Connecticut Core Standards, and there are many of them per grade level. What's interesting about the way this is presented, it shows us that the standards are organized into categories that we call domains. The domains begin in kindergarten and they build all the way through high school. For example, you'll see that in kindergarten we begin with measurement and data. We work on that through fifth grade in middle school and maybe we're using non-standard units to measure in kindergarten and then we move to standard measurements in fifth grade measured to the decimal and to different measurements within those measuring systems and then we move all the way up into probability and statistics into high school. Those foundational years are very important and it builds all the way along. The other piece we're going to refer to later would be the delineations between K-5, 6, 8, and then high school. It looks very solid. K-5 works together, 6, 8 works together, and high school works together. We have some observations about that that we'll dive into later in the presentation, but we thought this visual was really on point with that. Um, if you'd like more information about the progressions, Sheila was able to hand out some of our documents there, and it breaks them down into more specific standards and the language in K-5, 6, 8, 6, yeah, 6, 8, sorry, and then the high school progressions. And like the, the practice standards, we see K-12 throughout all the classrooms um, this I like is a good visual because it really breaks up um, what's going on in K-5 and then what 6-8 pulls from K-5 when they cover those specific domains through the middle school uh, in preparation for then getting to the high school um, and so it's a nice flow of the standards throughout the K-12 uh, program. At the middle school, this is what I have here is the, the, main, the main in the STEM uh, math progression. Based on data we, uh, we collect in the fifth grade and fourth grade, we meet in the, in the spring with all the fifth grade teachers to, to talk about placement for students entering sixth grade. A majority of the students will go on a math six, which handles the grade six math standards. We select about 40 students that are considered double accelerated into the pre-algebra classes. There's one over in STEM, 
and then one also at Jockey Hollow. Um, from there, a majority of students will go from Math 6 to Math 7 to Math 8, and what that does is then prepare them to enter Algebra 1 in high school. Um, from 7th to 8th grade, again, we look at the data from 7th and determine uh, a handful of students who accelerate to Algebra 1 in 8th grade. Um, those are usually based on their SBAC scores, star scores, their grades, how they do in the classroom, how they're performing, are they doing their homework, are they preparing well for class, and are they ready to make that, that acceleration into Algebra 1. Um, the students who we accelerated back from 5th to 6th follow along the path of pre-algebra, algebra 1, and geometry, um, and that allows them to then enter Algebra 2 as they reach the high school. So at the high school level, and again, it, it depends on where they enter. So if you're a math aide, you'll enter right at the Algebra 1, and for the most part, follow along that path, Algebra 1, Geometry, to Algebra 2, on to Pre-Calculus. And again, if you start in Geometry, then you follow along, or Algebra 2. Um, we also offer courses that are, are down below who are considered bridge courses. Um, intermediate Algebra 2 is a bridge course from Geometry to Algebra 2 for those students who really had their struggle with Algebra 1 and need a, a, a support class before taking Algebra 2, mainly their senior year. Um, and that's usually one of those courses that really revisits a lot of the Algebra 1 topics, gets into some of the Algebra 2 topics as kind of a pre preparation for them to then take Algebra 2. Um, advanced Math is a course that we, we uh, offer to students as a bridge from Algebra 2 to Pre-Calculus. Um, and again, just like Intermediate Algebra 2, this is a course for those students who really struggle with the algebra. It revisits a lot of the Algebra 2 topics. I like to call it Algebra 3. Um, and that it does really get into some of the pre-calc topics, um, such as the higher level functions, as well as the trigonometry. So then they're ready to take pre-calculus the following year. Um, the other two courses I have on there, um, with the switch, the nine credits in STEM, um, we, still, we still want three credits in mathematics overall, but this allows us different pathways um, to college. I know statistics is becoming a very popular uh, major. Many of, the, um, many of the other majors in college ask for a statistics course. Um, so a lot of students, when they enter their junior year, and they start kind of getting a better idea of what they want to do in college, a number of them might go the path of statistics, either in addition to the math of pre-calc and calculus, or instead of that path of, of pre-calc and calculus. Um, and it does give them that more flexibility to, depending on what um, they're looking to do in college. What's also nice with the nine credits at STEM, um, that includes the science and the business courses. So, you know, students interested in either going the science route or even personal finance or business route, um, though they still need to make the three years of mathematics part of the requirement, they have more flexibility to take business and science courses as part of that overall umbrella of STEM, um, again, depending on what they're interested in when they're looking to go to college. Through K-12, we have uh, math intervention. This is designed for, to help students uh, support in the classroom or with some of the basic math skills that they had um, difficulty with, especially coming out of the pandemic and hybrid learning and getting back in the classroom full time. Um, we have at all the buildings either, and it's called different things, but it really has the same idea, whether it's win, pause, or flex. We have a dedicated amount of time where all students can access teachers to help get support, whether it's a classroom or whether their skills. Um, and just speaking at the middle and high school level, it's about a 30 minute time every day. Um, kids sign up for it in order if they want to that they want to go see their science teacher to make up science, or they want to go see their math teacher because they didn't understand quite what the lesson was and wanted extra help, that they wanted to go to a study hall because they know they just have time to do work. They have that opportunity to do that at this, this time. Um, and again, it, it does give the, uh, the students an opportunity to be in a smaller group setting. Um, they can re reinforce concepts they've learned. They can work on building their math skill. Um, they just give them that opportunity to um, to really work on their math. We also at K-12, we have mathematics interventionists. Um, these interventions, um, I have, personally I have two at the middle school, one at the high school. And again, they, are, they will pull kids in small groups, they will be assigned to that class, whether it's every other day or every day. And again, to help support them in the classroom, 
they push into classes to just be another um, help if a teacher's doing an activity or doing something that they know that might need um, the extra help of the interventions. The interventions could go into that class. Um, we try to schedule them as best we can, but we do have to just determine, all right, is it, you know, are they need to work with kids in a small group setting or work in the classrooms? They go back and forth. And it, you know, did you want to talk about the K-5? Go ahead. <laughs> about K -5. Um, in the K-5 programming, we also have very similar options to Flex or Win. It might be called something different at each of the elementary schools, and the structure might run a little bit differently depending on time and uh, personnel. But we currently have one mathematics interventionist at each elementary school this year, designated math interventionist. That is new for us. And we're so happy to have that this year. We're even happier to say that we have another position budgeted for each elementary school going forward to next year. So that means we would have two math interventionists at each of the elementary schools. And as Kevin spoke about, the interventionists are available to support teachers in the classroom with small groups. And they are also available to make small groups and pull students out of the classroom if they need more targeted help with skills. So they're really a support to the teacher their support to the students, and it, this is really um, to affect a need that we identified, and we appreciate that help, and it's something that we are so happy that we can continue. Um, going to the school year, uh, we determined a focus for mathematics should be on communication, and really um, having those mathematical conversations in the classroom. Uh, we felt coming out of the, you know, the hybrid and the, the full at home learning, that is what was lacked at that time. The, really, the, the conversations, the mathematical conversations that would occur in the classroom. Um, so we encourage more student-centered activities for more peer-to-peer -peer discussions. Um, just walking around, so I'll pop into classes and hearing a conversation with students, sometimes you might hear something that among themselves that maybe the teacher didn't quite mention, where it's something, a different way to solve a problem, or something one student noticed another student did. Um, and, and that goes to the, also the teacher and student feedback. It's great having that teacher feedback as the teacher is, is moving around, working with groups and calling them up or, or sitting down and, and really kind of digging deeper into a smaller group. But it's also great when you hear one student look to the other and go, hey, you know, two plus two is four, not five, or what, you know, something where they're, they're pointing out that they might not have that, that opportunity to do if they're sitting in just you know one to one and, and either listening to the teacher or, or being online like they were before, it's really that that feedback too has been great. Um, we also, if you see pictures, especially the ones on the bottom, more displays of their thinking. We want to encourage kids go up to the board, show us what you're doing, show us what you're thinking, go up in groups, have arguments, have conversations, talk the math out. You know, it, it, let's see what you're doing. It's a lot easier to see on these these boards than it is the piece of paper on their desk where they're jotting down some notes or writing down some ideas. Um, with that, if you look to the right, the middle of elementary school, we're having them uh, read a book called Building Thinking Classrooms and Mathematics. Um, and this is, you know, just some strategies in the classroom. It, it just speaking at the middle school level, we went through the first three chapters already, which talks about giving enriching tasks, um, grouping students, and then using, you know, vertical whiteboards for those discussions. And, you know, just, you know, observing the teachers trying some of the strategies from the book and really trying to get these kids to have these mathematical conversations um, and, it, and it enriches their math vocabulary um, and it also is, it, the hope is that it gives them a deeper understanding of the mathematics they're doing as well as really helping each other out in the classroom to become better math students. We see in the pictures the little ones at the top row there they're using their whiteboards and why I picked that one is they're talking to each other so they're communicating about math in math language, but they're also chosen different strategies or similar but quite different strategies to work out their problems. And then they're checking their mathematical computation. So within these activities, they're problem solving, they're choosing strategies, they're communicating their thinking, and they have someone else looking over their shoulder to double check their computation and say, does this look right? Does this, or do I need to revise this? So they're owning their thinking, they're constructing their thinking, and they are going deeper. And as Kevin said, this really builds the mathematical language and the discussion and the conversation. In elementary classrooms, teachers were noticing the last couple of years that the ability to discuss and use academic language was an area that we had some concerns about in lower elementary, that students came to us in a little bit of a different place. 
So this not only is engaging and appropriate for them, but there's a real academic purpose to this. So growing from what we just learned about our students, their needs, their engagement, their language, their ability to work hard and persevere, comes what do we do to move forward with our K-8 mathematics alignment? K-8 was important to us because when we looked at those domains initially, we saw they were K-5 and then 6-8 in the delineations. And many times we looked just at that when we chose mathematical resources and wrote out scope and sequence for what we're going to do with students each year. We looked separately in the elementary level and the middle school level. And when we looked at going forward, we thought maybe it's time to align K-8. <coughs> we saw from those domains and progressions, we build one year to the next, to the next, to the next. And wouldn't we be doing students a better service by aligning our strategies, our language, and building aligned curriculum all the way from K-8 and then into high school. And that would mean maybe we want to look a little bit more closely at a grounding resource that we all use. Um, it was time for the middle school to look a little bit more closely at their resource. We revise our resources every now and then. And it's time for them to take a look. But we thought if Kevin's looking at middle school re resources, it's time for us to take that look too. Um, we know that illustrative mathematics was a term that came up. We learned that from many other districts, but we also found that the state of Connecticut released um, their math units, templates for us to use in Connecticut for mathematics in grade six, eight, those were released. Illustrative math was a resource recommended to us by the state of Connecticut. When last year, Sheila recommended that one of us look at joining the grade four curriculum design team, I was on that. And we also found that the state is recommending illustrative math in that grade three, five band. Then more currently, they're working on the K2 band and in grade one, I'm on that team, they're also recommending illustrative math in the K2 band. So we said, there's a pattern here. <laughs> illustrative math meets the needs of many of our students for many reasons. So that may be a grounding resource that we look to use. And the reason why they, um, committees across the country like it is that it was designated the highest scoring math resource right now. Um, Ed Report said 14 out of 14 was its score for focus and coherence. And Kevin and I have been speaking about our focus and coherence as a need through the district, as well as those mathematical practices that scored an 18 out of 18. We said from the beginning, we build our mathematical program from the mathematical practices, and it has a very good um, look in that area. It's an open educational resource, which means it's delivered online to all educators at no cost. The cost is involved for choices at the district level. We would pay for teacher professional development if we choose to, in areas we choose to. We would decide what materials and manipulatives we would choose to purchase for our district and our students and our teachers. So it does give you a lot of choice in that. You could just lose the online resource so 100% and not be not buy anything in addition. So it really does give you that opportunity to work with it the way you choose. And it is a problem-based learning approach. There are problems, children solve problems, they use their thinking, and they communicate their thinking. That embraces the five competencies of the vision of the graduate, we believe very well. We thought you'd like to see some examples pulled from the resource. And this is a grade five example. It was about finding volume that we actually did this year in grade five. All grades K-5 this year chose one unit to try with students. And in grade five, they chose volume. It starts the uh, beginning with a warm up. A, B, C, D, which one does not belong and why? You might say A does not belong because it's a, four, it's a cube. There are four cubes on the bottom layer, four cubes on the top layer. It's a two by two by two structure. That's the only one that's built like that. I had to talk to you about the layers. I had to talk to you about the shape. I was counting. I was using mathematical understandings to explain my thinking. You could choose any one of those items there and be correct as long as your thinking justifies what you were thinking, right? Then we move on to the activity, which was guess my prism. In this activity, students were given different um, numbers of cubes and they needed to create an object out of those cubes and have their partner build it. They could describe. There are four 
cubes on the bottom layer, four cubes on the second layer, four cubes on the third layer, and you'd have to build it. I'm just making those numbers up. That's not what's up there. I know. That's not what's up there, Dennis. I can't really see what's up there. Very Kevin, I can't really see what's up there, but I know what's up there. So the kids built their prisms, and they gave directions to the other students, and they actually played that, and they had some fun. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see how this ties into an SBAC question. And this is an SBAC question from our IABs about rectangular prisms, and I just wanted to throw a picture in there of some of our kids actually doing this in fifth grade. Um, the question is, Ethan is building a rectangular prism, and the bottom layer of the rectangular prism is shown. He builds a prism that has five layers, enter the volume in cubic centimeters of the complete rectangular prism. So students have been building prisms. They understand the language of layers. They understand that there are multiple layers. It's what depth and width and height. They've practiced it, they built it. They've gone from concrete to representational in their notes that they drew and their pictures they drew, and then they give you an answer. It builds it from an authentic understanding so when kids move on to sixth grade, they would pick up with the next level of unit in illustrative building on volume, knowing what kids have done the year before. And we're hoping that that really helps move into middle school. What I have in here is an example of, of the eighth grade, and we're all familiar with y equals mx plus b. I think as we think back to algebra one classes, we've all learned that at some point in our life. So I want to show one thing is that this is not a, a, a change in terms of what's being, the content being taught, but what I find fascinating about this, and I like it, is the way it's being taught. So it starts with a problem where um, Diego's earning $10 for babysitting, um, and no money is saved in advance, and they ask you to graph the, the initial line, and you'll start at zero, zero, and after one hour, it's $10, after two hours, it's $20, three hours, $30, so it builds upon the proportional relationships that were discussed prior in this course. So what I like about it, it just builds on what they've worked on, where at times I think now sometimes you feel like everything's done in isolation, mm -hmm. and we're doing Y equals MX to B, and then we're doing, but this starts and it builds on something we talked about in, in the unit prior in terms of the proportional relationship, and then it gets into what if we save $30? and then what is the amount they have. So what that does, it takes that line and it translated up 30 units on the y-axis. And again, that goes back to an earlier unit on transformations, transforming shapes, talking similar triangles. So you see this common thread that starts from the beginning and goes throughout um, each unit after unit and builds on it. And I was in a classroom, this was a couple weeks ago, where they were talking about parallel lines and, and angles uh, formed by these parallel lines, I saw a girl go, oh, that's what we learned about the translating lines up and down. And I'm in the back going, that's what, that's what I, I was, just, I got excited about it, I'm sorry, but I, <laughs> it doesn't take much. But I, I was like, that's it, that's a connection I wanted to see. And I saw that in the classroom and I was excited to see that, because that's what I see here. This connection among several different concepts and several different units that brings you up to the understanding of what y equals, M, y equals mx was big. And then when you get to the cool down, it talks about similarities and differences. And it talks about now describe, you know, the difference between y equals 2x and y equals 2x minus 7 and explain or show your reasoning. There's the communication right there. There's the communication talking about what the student sees, and it could be several different answers. I'm not, it's not one concrete, this is the answer to this. You have students that come up with different observations, and they can share those observations. And then that brings in that also that talking points within this. So I thought this was, a, this was a very good example of what we're looking at in this resource and how it's getting students to, to really communicate and really build upon prior knowledge. And this ties into it. This is a, an eighth grade problem. The one on the left, again, brings you know, a, a proportional relationship problem that they'll see on their, their aspect test when they take it in May. Um, and they're really just straight for actually what is the proportional relationship between the two variables. And then to the right, they're asked to graph that line and y equals mx plus b. So really, here's two problems right here that really stems from that lesson that they covered in the eighth grade class. Um, overall, we recognize the students are struggling in the classes. We recognize that we want to support them. We want to support them with the intervention. We want to support them in the classroom with the communication among the students. Um, we feel that the resource then helps them as they, they progress, not only just through the year, but through 
the K8 continuum. It, it, this is a change where we had one resource K5, and then 6-8, they'd move to a different one. Um, and then we really kind of look at that fifth to sixth bridge too as well as students enter from the elementary school in the Jockey Hollow. Um, and so we really felt uh, in addition to some of the strategies that were put in place at the K-8 level um, that were really helping these students build the skills from the last couple of years and also progress through uh, the math program. Thank you. Thank you. If I can start off with uh Breathe. breathe. <laughs> if, I can, uh, if I can start off just with a, a, a quick question. You, you mentioned the, the win, the flex, pause time. Is that all student initiated? In other words, if I'm a student and I need extra help, I contact my teacher. Or is there also a teacher? Yeah, I see. Yeah, it's both. So if the teacher an issue? sees a student struggling in the class, they could request that student to come see them at some point um, during the week. And the challenge is if you have a student who's being requested by a lot of teachers, um, to then have that communication teacher teacher say hey listen can I pull them on Tuesday I want to make sure I meet with them before I test Wednesday is it okay if I know you wanted to also see them Tuesday can you put it off to another day so they're also teachers could request students um, but the students every day at least I can speak for the high school level and middle school every day that they'll they'll look at their day look at the schedule and if they're not requested they'll determine I want to go see this teacher go to do this activity go see this teacher yeah I was thinking of the student that may need the help but doesn't want to admit mm -hmm. it and and it needs that push mm -hmm. it needs to to say you need to be here yeah in the elementary level it's initiated by the teacher and it's done in a few different ways so if you're within the classroom you may not even know that you're one of the ones the teacher said that the interventionist is going to meet with because it's done very um, fluidly within the classroom when we do our small group discreetly yeah. yeah yeah I'm thinking of the shy kid that doesn't mm -hmm. want to right. needs the help but doesn't right. want to ask for <clears> it and then has yeah. problems later on so that's good. Uh, Dennis? Yeah, I'm maybe dating myself here, but you know, is there any math club in high school? or? There is. There's a middle school math club and a uh, middle school. It's definitely a high school math club. They meet on Fridays. They're actually, they might go to a competition at the end of March up in Southern. We're, oh. trying, to, we're trying to figure out the transportation. I guess you've got shooting stars of math, math whizzes out there <laughs> that really can yeah. help colleagues, so that's great. Yeah. Especially if they can tie their break time into it. It's pretty good. Yeah. Nice. Well, I meant you too. No. We've done uh, pro projects during wind time, so we've done extension progress projects that children could choose to do. Um, we've done some for statistics, and we've done some for um, problem solving, for recycling nice. problem solving. Um, so we've done a few different. Those that would be student choice. Nice. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you much. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Get them psyched. Make them happy. Good stuff. <laughs> okay, we are on unfinished business, which we have none. So we'll move to new business, and we're going to go to A, policies, first review. Uh, Shannon, can you take us through these three? Yes. Please? Yes, I can. Okay, um, the first one that we're looking at, technology use and monitoring policy that was updated with the language of the policy to current technology tools and current procedures. The second one, the social media policy, updated to define district-sponsored social media procedures while protecting students and staff. A lot of these really, they just needed updated and to have the language be what it needed to be in the policy for the state requirements. But, and the last one was bring your own technology acceptable use policy um, updated the language in the policy to current procedures and protections for the students. Jerry or Christine, anything from uh, all the policy file the cave <laughs> initiatives? <laughs> yes. Okay. Thanks, Sheila and Paul. Mike actually helped out. The tech integrators uh, chipped down on these two. On um, um, so. So number one and number two are mainly cleanup language, um, if I understand this correctly. And then number three, uh, was Paul involved yes, in that? Yes, thank you, to Paul, for being here tonight. I meant to start with this. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Paul, for being here for tonight to answer any questions that we have. And also, he was at the policy meeting when we went over this. So um, 
talked about all of these things and the two factor and all of that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, if you have questions, now is the time. <laughs> the time. Yeah, well, that was my first thought. I was I was hoping you were involved in in that rewrite. Um, then my second thought on that was um, I think we have a lot of education to do with our students, specifically with some of these policies about you know FERPA and they can't take each other's pictures or videos and that's a very very difficult thing to do nowadays because there's probably thousands of pictures and videos being taken that are against the law and against policy technically in our school systems um, so I think we have to when we roll out this policy um, uh, after we vote it in at the next meeting probably is a lot of education I know there's only so much you can do about it too but I think we need to get that message out um, so Alan. Uh, just a general technology question. Um, so student, um, I don't know, any student visits a site that he's not supposed to be visiting. And obviously we have something in place that would block it. But does someone get alerted that the student went to that website? Yes. Paul, you want to come up? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. So does something let you know that somebody using computer X just went to site X? We is the question. Somebody access Literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we can run reports if need be um, and track activity that way, uh, but we typically don't get an alert um, for web categories. We will get alerts for malicious files we will get alerts for um, malicious links that are clicked in emails, uh, but specifically browsing, it's just, it's a lot of data. So, um, but we can go back and look at history. Okay. Yeah, I just know the school I'm at, the uh, vice principal gets an instant message sent to her anytime a student goes somewhere that students shouldn't be, including like violent images, and they get called down Mm. And Paul, how, how did you explain it to us where they can't get on the, the search engines that have, do you know? So one, one of the things that we've done, um, we have multiple layers of filters. We filter, first and foremost, we filter at our firewall. Our firewall does web filtering. And then on top of that, once we get out the firewall and we go to the internet, our internet is provided by SEND, the Connecticut Education Network, and they have the IBOSS filtering. Um, so we literally have two layers of, of filtering going on. What we discovered was um, there were students that were attempting to circumvent the filtering by, I know, right, that's crazy. Um, <laughs> They would use what's called a VPN, a virtual private network. And so what that does is that that makes a connection uh, as a VPN, encrypted connection, to a VPN server out on the Internet. And then they would go from there out to wherever. wherever. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why it wasn't filtered was because it wasn't, it didn't fall under those those categories or those particular web URLs, those web addresses. Um, through our firewall, we have now blocked uh, what they call IP traffic, which is, which is firewall protocol, or I should say VPN protocol traffic. We have absolutely shut that down, much to the dismay of yeah. the students. <laughs> So I'm, I'm gonna Those I'm are gonna go out on a liars. limb and say <laughs> I'm gonna say there's gonna be some more engaged students in in classrooms. We're, we're gonna they hope, can't so. circumvent. I don't know if that's the different than what you were talking about at your school. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I I just know um, the the system principal gets a message with regards to what website the kid tried. To I go think to. that's a um, a service that they pay for though, because don't they also get um notifications if there's some kind of threat or a student writes something about self-harm or there's like another well we we also so through google our google um, classroom or google apps for education uh, we have email filtering and if 
there's an email that is sent or received to or from a student that falls under, and the, the criteria is massive, but if it falls under any one of those parameters, it automatically gets quarantined and it does not get released until it is reviewed by a staff member. It's the Raptor system, Alan. Oh, okay. It's okay. part of Raptor. <clears throat> the one that you're thinking of. Well, while you're here. Yes. Um, do you want to mention anything while we're while we're all here um, with about the two-factor authentication and the security at <laughs> your 24-hour stint here? Like how that, do what, like why why we're at and how, why it's so important. Yeah, I, I should just go around at this point and say who 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 doesn't know anything about 2FA? Um, <laughs> but why? The, why and and they'll there'll be a reminder. Actually, check your email tomorrow. I'm I'm actually sending <laughs> another one out tomorrow because we're we're getting down to a week. Um, so the two-factor authentication, if you do anything uh, with like online banking, for example, a lot of those types of platforms will now require uh, two-factor authentication. Um, I've tried to keep the email simple, and I, I do apologize if there is confusion about the technology. Um, what we're looking to protect is anything that we house internally on our network that faces the internet because that's how the hackers get it at this point the only thing that we house internally that faces the internet is webmail so webmail is if you sit down at a computer and you open up a web browser like chrome and you go to boewebmail.monroeps.org or for the, um, for the teachers, they would go to webmail.monroeps.org. It's an actual website. They can log in and they can get their email. Um, that is the only resource that we're looking to protect with 2FA. If you use a native phone client, okay, such as uh, the mail built into the iPhone, and you set that up for district email. You do not need 2FA because it uses a completely different protocol um, and it's not as vulnerable as the website. That being said, if you have district email on your phone using the client that's built into your phone, in the event of a catastrophic emergency, and it's only happened once in the last decade that I've, I've been here plus, we can send the device a remote wipe command. So, and this is actually good for everybody to know because if your phone does get stolen and you've got things that are on there that are very sensitive or have district data on your phone, we can send it a remote wipe command and the next time that that phone checks in with the internet it will wipe itself for that address only or for everything the entire phone the whole phone everything wiped pictures data yeah everything um and that is to protect the district and the district's data um and so again, I was only asked to do this once, and believe me, this wouldn't be something that I would arbitrarily make the decision and say, okay, we're gonna wipe it. I mean, this, this would need Joe's approval, or you know, I, th this would, I, I can't even imagine where this would come into, into play, where I would need to do that. Because typically when an account gets breached, the first thing we do is we disable the account. We disable the account and we actually reset our web server to disable the, the connection. And that's usually it. And then we wait for the user to call us and say, hey, I can't get in. <laughs> well, hey, you know, we found out that your account was sending out thousands of spam emails. Um, so, you know, this is, this is, and this was part of the push of the whole October Cyber Awareness Month, which I'll be doing again next year or I should say later this year, um, is to change that culture because people need to understand. I mean, we, you know, 
uh, when I went out in front of the schools and I said, you know, gave them in services, you know, how many people are still using the same password since you've been here, you know, and you know, sheepishly people, you know, raise their hands. How many of you have that same password that you've been here 10, 15 years? How many of you use it for other websites? Uh, you know, saw less hands, but I know that they, there should have been more hands up because the, the look said it all, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we, as I would say to the staff, I said, listen, I, I hate to be like this, but the pain train is coming. You will be required to start changing your passwords. You will be required for two-factor authentication. And the two-factor authentication you know, involves something more than just your username and password. Because if you've got that out anywhere out on the internet, you know, they've got it. It's out on the dark web. You know, I could take Jerry's, you know, I can go out on the dark web. I'm sure I can find Jerry's, Jerry's information all over out the there. Dark web. He's all over, <laughs> all over the dark web. Well, I'm going to pick on Jerry. A lot of money out there. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, so that... Again, it's only it's only if you're going to use the actual website to log into log into your webmail. Um, if you have Outlook, the actual mail client installed on a lap, like our our teachers and administrators, they have laptops. They have the Outlook client installed. Don't need 2FA. If they're home and they're connected to their Wi-Fi, it's already an encrypted connection. Okay, so it's only if you're using the, the website. Thank you. So, Paul, why don't you send us a lot of e email going through how, once we go to the App Store and we put in Alpha, how we go through the process. Like, it wants, uh, here, Paul, ready, the server, it wants the username, the domain name, the description. Just send us an email on how to put it all in. I know how to do it. You showed me, but I don't know if everybody knows how to mm -hmm. install it. So then they go I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I tell I you what, at the next meeting for 20 bucks, bring your device yeah. in. <laughs> Paul 20. Will do it. 20. <laughs> you see my budget? <laughs> no, I, but that said, listen, it's the same procedure if you've got it natively on your phone. But, at, you know, absolutely. I mean, we I can send I something send out. Up, you send yeah. that out. That sure. Way, if they want to. Just make the call. In. Yep. I'll make the call. But for the rest of us, the policy change is great. I think this was an ad. The board will not be responsible for unauthorized financial ob obligations resulting from Jerry's use of or access to the board's <laughs> computer network or the internet. <laughs> the board assumes no responsibility for unauthorized charges made by employees, including but not limited to credit card charges, subscriptions, long distance. So the policy is a good one. We're protected there. We can't protect necessarily the morals of kids stopping them, but you know, I'm sure you're doing a great job. But you know. At least we are financially safe. Two point. <laughs> yes, I mean one of the things, and, and this goes to the initiative that that we're we're almost there. I'm really hoping by the by the end of this month that we're 100 percent complete, and that's that Center for Internet Security, Version mm -hmm. Eight Implementation Group One, Fruit Salad that I've talked about and these are specific security settings that will prevent unauthorized installation of, of software Perfect. it's all good thank you yeah thank you thank you, thank you. It's challenging appreciate there. it any other uh, comments or questions on any of these three policies no well I'll put them on the agenda for next meeting for a second review and a vote okay Dennis, were you going to say no? Okay. Yes, Ron. Well, before we adjourn, um, monthly water service charge. Was it? Yeah. No zero usage on the shopping cart. Okay. Yeah. So it's just a, a monthly. Yeah. Okay. So. So it's broken down over the. It's just yeah. it's the same fee. Each, they just flex it over eight months, nine months, whatever. Month. Right. Yeah, Do we need it at Chalk Hill? Uh, you know, if, um, if we're going to continue to irrigate the field, we need right. a meter there. So that's a, okay. Jockey Hollow walks over and uses it. Yeah, no, I get that. Gym but like, do we need the water yeah. thing at Chalk Hill, you know, monthly, so for the irrigation? You yeah, know? if they're going to, if it needs water. To, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Right. We we can check with Dan about it. We'll ask Dan. Jerry, you have something? What say ye? Motion to adjourn. Motion by Jerry to adjourn. Seconded by Shannon. Any further discussion? No? All in favor? Hey. Unanimous. Thank you. Good night, everybody.